by primary care viewers. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. So I will be speaking more regarding uh, pediatric sleep disturbances. I'm not talking about disorders because I was asked to keep it more short and brief, so we can have some take-home points rather than discussing sleep disorders uh, as a general. So what we'll be talking today is why is sleep important. We all know we need sleep. Uh, when you ask someone that specific question, it's hard for them to explain that. Uh, how much sleep should my child get? That is always a question we get from parents. Uh, and then what I want to talk about is childhood behavior insomnia and treatment for it. It is a little different than organic insomnia with this medication. I want to just talk about the behavioral aspect of it, what you guys see and what you guys can do in terms of early intervention. Uh, then we'll talk about delay phase disorder and treatment. Uh, you will see this in different clinical presentation, but I thought it was really important for us as clinicians as well as parents to come kind of like this. Uh, and then the, we'll talk about nightmare versus night terrors. Uh, as a sleep psychologist, I spend a lot of time educating parents and educating them when they deal with this situation, uh, differentiating between nightmares and night terrors and how to deal with them. And then at the end, we'll just talk about uh, some general sleep recommendations for different age groups. So why is sleep important? Before I start that question, I know people take great pride on how less they sleep. What do you guys think? What's the less you have slept and you, you felt like you could feel you well? Anyone want to share the problem moment of two hours or three hours sleep? Or is everyone getting, everyone sleeping 10 hours? <laughs> <laughs> now, about two hours people here, we can brag and say that they will sleep two hours and sleep really well. Five hours I sleep. Daily five hours. <coughs> sleep is an investment. A lot of people don't think in that way, but you know when we invest in something, we get a lot of things in return. Why is it an investment? It affects our memory, uh, our time. Uh, as Dr. Mohammed said before that, with ADHD, uh, it also impacts sleep and then how that goes into it. Lower our stress. We, we get, tend to get more stress when we're not sleeping well. Uh, just healthy habits. Well, just when you're dealing with weight gain, it also is related to your sleep. Um, staying healthy, living better, improve creativity. So if you look, when you do this investment in sleep, when you are actually getting the sleep you're supposed to get, what happens inside your body? You have an enhanced lymphatic function <coughs> and immune resistance. So it's helping you to be more healthy. You have increased energy, so you can interact with people. When you are asleep, you are not able to focus, you don't want to talk to people. You get annoyed easily. Uh, improved weight loss and uh, glucose levels. It also helps you, uh, your own well being. And then also, coordination, right? Uh, a lot of accidents and things happen because of sleep deprivation. They're not able to make those judgment uh, calls. That's the, uh, on the outside. What about the inside of your brain? Increase focus and creativity. You can perform at your highest level. Uh, when we're sleep deprived, we study for long hours, we don't do well in an exam just because we did not sleep well. Uh, enhance the ability to learn complex skills, helping to retain information. There's a lot of research where information from short term memory is uh, consolidated in uh, long term memory with good sleep. If you're not sleeping well, that information is not consolidated well. And the most important thing, most of the regulation, right? How agitated people are when they're not sleeping well. You get annoyed easily, you get upset easily, you don't want people to talk to you. In the morning, I'll make sure I take drink my coffee, even if I go to sleep before I talk to people. It helps, it helps me more be more awake and when you're <coughs> sleep. So those small things. Now let's talk about kids. Why is it important? 50% of kids will experience a sleep problem. Not a sleep disorder, we're just talking about a problem. They will have a sleep problem. Now what we need to do is have early identification of this sleep problem to prevent negative consequences. Data sleepiness. <coughs> if a kid is having data sleepiness, what will happen? What will it affect? <coughs> Schools, right? One of the basic socializing, just <coughs> heritability. Heritability. If you're not sleeping well, you're more heritable. Uh, behavioral problems. A lot of young kids are having there are behavior problems in the day because they're agitated and annoyed and sleep deprived. Um, learning difficulties. And then poor academic performances. One of my most important things when I work with teenagers is motor vehicle accidents. A lot of teenagers that are not sleeping well and then they get engaged in other behaviors, not able to make judgments. So that's why sleep is important. Now, how much do we be getting? If you look at this chart right here, So two to a twelve month old usually get twelve to sixteen hours of sleep, uh, and they are averaging two hours of nap. The reason I want to put the information of the nap is when you come down to get to thirteen years old, they are 
they're sleeping eight to ten hours, they should be sleeping eight to ten hours. And then if they are napping, but they're usually not napping. If your teenager is napping, all of a sudden this is a red flag. You have to look into what's happening. While all of a sudden they're now they need them, they're tired. So this is good information you kind of have. <laughs> the way they should sleep and be scheduled with the napping is if you look at this chart, it kind of explains you better how newborn need more frequent naps as they get older, no naps. And then as an adult, you feel better like at 11 o'clock. If you're staying until 12 or 1 a.m., that's not good either. You need to sleep continuously. If there's an interruption, again, that's right. Like you need to check what's happening. Why you're not sleeping well? Why are you having sleep disturbances or interruptions? My most favorite thing, behavior in insomnia of ch childhood. I work with insomnia in adults as well, but for kids, it's really interesting because when we think of this, or hear of insomnia, we feel like inability to sleep. Your kid goes to bed and they cannot sleep. What would you guys do as a clinician if a kid does that? They're not able to sleep. Would you medicate them? Would you try to get them more treatment? Sleep Thank you, Dr. Dhanan. Get more information. We need to figure out what's happening, right? We need to jump into conclusion. So behavior insomnia of childhood is characterized by inability to fall asleep or stay asleep. And it affects 10 to 30 percent, uh, which is a very big percentage, especially when they end up in your clinic. Uh, the condition can be divided into two types, and this is very important. The sleep onset association type. This is characterized by unwilling to fall asleep, or they, they all return to, uh, when they wake up, they don't go back to sleep. And there's specific schedule things is done, like parent blocking them, specific parent blocking them to the bed. This becomes a problem, let's say the father is the one who's blocking the, the kid to the bed and staying by bedside. The father is traveling, what happened those nights? Okay, so a lot of behavioral issues, a lot of problems. So this is what the sleep onset association time. The second one is the limit setting time. This occurs when uh, the kid does not want to go back to the sleep. They, when they get up, they don't want to go back to their bed, they want to sleep in the parents' bed. A lot of time, these kids end up in clinic when they are 10 or 12 years old and they're still sleeping in their parents' bed. Uh, I was talking earlier to a colleague and I had an interesting case about a month ago. I didn't plan to share it, but I think it's really important to kind of highlight the importance of this. I saw a 24-year-old in sleep and the sleep physician sent it to me because she was presenting symptoms of narcolepsy and insomnia, which is an interesting presentation because narcolepsy, you're sleeping all the time. Insomnia, don't sleep at all. But this patient was not sleeping at night, but really sleep at daytime. So then I was asked to do a full uh, sleep cycle and behavior assessment to figure out what's happening. Can you guys take a guess what was the problem? Just saying to the with that presentation, what do you guys suspect with this patient we're dealing with? Anxiety. Anxiety caused by different setting types. Because this patient was sleeping with the mother under the age of 24, who recently got married. Husband is home three days a week, traveling for two weeks. The two weeks he's traveling, she's not sleeping at night because she's terrified of the dark. This was never addressed as a child because all her life she was the mother. She was sharing bed with the mother. So this parent patient could easily be misdiagnosed with insomnia or narcolepsy. But in the full assessment, we realized that it was more related to behavior insomnia from childhood, which now became anxiety disorder. With the anxiety treatment with myself and the psychiatrist, we were able to manage that. But for this reason, we need more information. We need a more detailed assessment. In general, when you have, uh, when we have patients who come for childhood insomnia, this is what usually the treatment looks like. So we start with parental education. That's the most important thing. Parents should take active role. We as clinicians can provide them as much intervention as we can in the 45 minutes, but they are the ones who needs to kind of uh, have a good sleep practice, have consistent feeding times, to, you know, control the nap times. We need a lot of help in there. Initially, we always recommend parents to try the unmodified extension. What we mean by that is what we recommend parents when they want to extend any behavior, ignore it. Uh, unless the child is hurting or in any danger, ignore it and then come back to it when the phase goes away. If this works, great. There is some success with it, but if not, then we come to gradual extension. Again, this is scheduled extension. We have kids who have a hard time falling asleep in bed. So the parent will stay in the room for one hour for the first week, closer to the bed. The next week they will stay in the room but not closer to the bed. Slowly, gradual extension their behavior and letting them fall asleep. Also, positive bedtime routines helps. Uh, this is another intervention we use in certain cases, depending on their cases. Uh, and then the last one is schedule awakening. This is kind of similar to what we do with adults who have insomnia, where they cannot fall asleep and they need to take a break and get out of bed. In this situation, the 
parent knows what time the kid wakes up and what time the behavior problem starts. They wake up their kid a little bit ahead of that and intervene. This also helps with setting the sleep uh, cycles. The next, the most important one is the delayed uh, sleep phase disorder. In this children with delayed period, sleep phase disorder, the habitual sleep wakes times are delayed by at least two hours uh, compared to the social norm. So let's say the social bedtime is 10 a.m. 10 p.m. in the house. This kid does not get sleepy or tired until 12. Again, this can present different in real life scenario, but this is what actually is happening when they are struggling with this disorder. Uh, the disorder is more common during adolescence. Uh, the reason for that is the circadian rhythm is kind of being lengthened. Uh, there's changes and they're also becoming more social. They have a lot more friends. They have a lot of social media they want to spend time with or do other things, cool things they think they can do at night time. Video gaming is the big one. <coughs> now the prevalence is 7 to 16%. That's a really big percentage for adolescents. Uh, and the way we diagnose this is by using parental histories and documenting sleep and wake times of this um, sleep diet. So we need a lot of extensive data to diagnose this. I, as I promised in the beginning, I wanted I didn't want to talk about diagnosis, I want to talk about problems. The reason I bring this up is this comes to our clinic because parents have a lot of problems there because the kids are not sleeping until 2 a.m. and then they're sleeping in the whole day, they're tired at school. They think there's a lot of some behavioral problem or they are kind of having some other issues. Uh, and then there's no frequent nighttime breaking, sleep architecture is okay, if you do a sleep study, everything comes out normal. Because they have the normal sleep cycle, it's just delayed. So let's use a visual representation to help with that. This is normal uh, desired uh, circadian sleep phase. You get sleep around 9 to 10 o'clock, you sleep, you wake up around 7 a.m. With these patients, what happens is, it's pushed a little bit. It's not that they want to stay up at night or they want to engage in that activity. They're just not sleeping because their cycles are being pushed. Now what does treatment look like? Treatment looks like, with, with the help of uh, the recommendation, is to, uh, you take some melatonin, uh, that will make them a little drowsy, and then avoid uh, lights. So then that way, we can reset uh, the phases. And then in the morning, bright light exposure. So these are, this is what the treatment looks like. Now what parents can do is, at least parents can help with this. They can start with some sleep hygiene, avoiding uh, technology at night time, with these kind of problems. Then when they come to us for treatment, we are more able to help with the other things. In the UAE, melatonin is not available over the counter, so you have to go to your sleep physician or a GP for prescription. But in the US and other places, some parents will go ahead and actually follow this. But the key thing I want to discuss today is to kind of uh, know the difference between delayed sleep phase uh, problem versus uh, patients who are most sleep resistant. Nightmares versus night terrors. Can someone tell me the difference? Yes. This guy. Thank you. So that's the key difference, right? Oh, the, 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 the remembrance of the incident. So what happens in nightmares is it happens when the child wakes from a bad dream. Uh, the, the, the child might remember the scary dream uh, and be a little bit afraid to go back to sleep. Uh, nightmares can be from worries as well. Something new happened, the child had a new fear, they uh, tried something different, or they're just generally afraid. Uh, it is good to talk to the child about the worries uh, when it, it happens from a nightmare. Uh, and then children are usually able to remember the nightmare. So the next, this is the key thing, the next morning when you ask them what happened, they might not remember the whole dream, but they will tell you that yes, I had a scary, scary dream. They will remember something happened. Uh, and in the middle of the night when it happens, when you give them a reassuring hug, uh, kind of give them reassurance, they're able to go back to sleep. Now this is completely different than night terrors, because it happens when the child are only partly arisen from deep sleep. So they're not really awake, but they're not completely asleep either. This falls under the classification of parasomies, which is half asleep, parasomia disorders with the patients that have asleep. They tend to start in the first two to three hours of the sleep and maybe at a predictable time. So having once in a while night terrors is common. This, uh, this uh, is incident peak between the age of three to six year old and then over time kids grow out of it. But let's say it's more consistent and more chronic and it's having a predictable time so we need an assessment to kind of diagnose night terror disorders or nightmare disorders. But also happen during a night here, the child brain is asleep, where the body looks awakened. They have the full facial experience, uh, expression, you feel like the child is awake. But when you actually shake them or wake them up, they are asleep. They have no memory of it in the morning. Uh, if the child might scream, you may frighten, usually not recognizing the people around them. They might be a little disoriented as well. 
and it's best to not try to wake a child up as it might prolong the episode. Uh, you can, you know, the child might remember being frightened but not about the dream. And that will happen when you wake them up and they realize that the surrounding accused were the parents were tense and worried. So if you look at the comparison, this is during the, during the uh, time of the night, the first uh, uh, night versus the REM sleep, presentation of the, during the event, during the night trial, and it's after the event. After you wake up from the stage, you, you realize you are afraid of something. Uh, movements is really common in sleep terrors. The night is really the patient is actually moving. Uh, severity is severe for sleep terrors, is mild for nightmares. Uh, same thing, amnesia, an important one, is present. They don't remember they have sleep terrors, but in nightmares they do. They are more confused when they wake up from night terror versus the sleep uh, when you have nightmare. Now, what do we do in this situation to help with nightmare versus night terror? <laughs> nightmares are bad when they are often related to worries about the child has. I saw a kid uh, about two months ago who was having frequent nightmares. Uh, there were, and then after the assessment, there were some sleep, uh, school problems. They were having some problems with the kid. But it escalated. The triggering meant for the child to have nightmares while they went to IMG and he tried to use right because the brother did him. Since then, the child started having a lot of nightmares and then all the other worries that come, uh, came along. So it's usually related to some worries. Talk to your child about the worries to help them go away. A lot of the time, we it from the parents. Primary care giving give is the, uh, the main intervention. Uh, night terrors usually happens one or two hours after falling asleep and can be very frightening for the parents. This is the main thing as part of the clinical psychologist I do is parent free training and time to Already? Time to But uh, And then do not try to wake up the child during uh, night terror. The best thing to do is make sure they are safe. They are not in. Uh, they are not going to hurt themselves because there is a risk of hurting themselves. They are moving, tossing and turning, and the bed is in a dangerous place. But there is not enough space. And then make sure the child gets enough sleep by by keeping the regular bedtime and routines. Uh, night terrors can increase during sickness. If the child is not feeling well, they're having fevers or any ongoing uh, infection or anything, it can increase. So it also is uh, good to make sure to get them checked out by the pediatrician. And then make sure there is no underlying sleep disorder, like OSA. We are in, uh, in disorders. And then if episodes are very severe and frequent, you might you want to take them to your doctor to kind of assess for any nightmare disorders. I think I'll just stop there rather than just in the general uh, recommendation. Questions? Comments? Yeah. Like any medication, when the uh, physician prescribes it, it has to be monitored. The uh, side effect has to be monitored, the dose it has to be monitored. That's why you have, you have to go through your the GP and make sure that it is kind of monitored. The dosage and side effects. The GP in the UAE, they are just using one medication. They are needing it. They have to need it. Like, I don't have any. And so, you know, the, the only things what I am telling you when I ask history, the child is sleeping from 3 till 9. How do you sleep the night? Just to change the level. So they're sleeping three times and it can be more of a sleep, uh, behavior sleep problem, more kind of displays, uh, delayed phase or any other uh, sleep initiation issues. The MRI is not Thank you. 
Uh, 